interoperability with other languages. So a module may hook into the use mechanism and we can actually use the use statement to load Tor 5 modules. And we don't even need the P5 object anymore. The thing that does not yet work is importing symbols that the loaded module exports. So I'm do doing this here manually. But other than that, you almost cannot tell the difference to a native Tor 6 module. Um, when you literally use a Tor 5 module using this, Inline Tor 5 uh, creates a Perl 6 package corresponding with the Perl 5 module. And in this package, it creates wrappers for all functions and methods that the Perl 5 module provides. And you can use this just as if it was a Perl 6 method. And with this, except for the used inline Perl 5, it very much looks like a basic Perl 6 module. So with this, we have access to a lot of C10 already. But some modules require you to actually subclass them to use them. So how do we subclass a Tor 5 class in Tor 6? Well, Inline Tor 5 provides a Perl 5 parent role. By consuming this role, you tell Inline Tor 5 that your Perl 6 class should act like a subclass of a Perl 5 class. Um, in memory, it pretty much looks like this. You have the Perl 5 base class object, and it's wrapped in a Perl 6 subclass object. And whenever a method is called on this Perl 6 object, it either provides it itself, or it delegates down to the underlying Perl 5 object. And this works regardless of the caller being Perl 6 code or Perl 5 code. Because if we pass this Perl 6 object to Perl 5 code, it gets wrapped another time in the Perl 5 wrapper object. So lots of wrapping, lots of delegation. And that's why I call this inheritance by delegation. So with this, we can use, for example, bot status bot, which requires you to subclass it to implement its behavior. And as you can see, we just use inline Perl 5, we load the bot basic bot module, and have our Perl 6 bot class consuming the Perl 5 parent role and telling it what's our base class. Then you can just go on and implement some methods, like the set method that gets called whenever so someone saves something on the IRC channel. And this is also where we implement the behavior of our bot. So when we are greeted, we greet back. And if we are asked to leave, then we quit. So starting the bot is just a matter of copy and paste from the bot basic bot documentation, modulo some syntax changes. The largest difference is that we have an additional argument to the constructor where we pass in our P5 object. And then we run it. And if this was a pure advertising talk, I'd probably stop here, but there's some gotcha. It turns out uh, in Perl 6, every class is a subclass of Moo. And this Moo class provides a say method. So it can just say any object in Perl 6 and get some sort of output. As I told you earlier, this inheritance by delegation <coughs> delegates all unknown methods. 
to the underlying Tau 5 object. But say is not unknown to Tau 6 object. So in this case, you have to be a bit more explicit and provide a say method yourself. And here we find our old friend, the invoke method again. This is just copy and paste from the Tau 5 parent role, really. This is what it does when you call a method and it has to delegate. So let's have a look at another example. Using HTML parser looks really just like the basic bot example. We again use Tau 5 parent role to subclass it in Tau 6. Now, if you have used HTML parser before, you might throw in that you don't actually have the subclass to use it. You can also pass in just some code references to implement the behavior. And inline Tau 5 would actually support this. But it, again, uh, there's a small problem. Um, HTML parser is implemented in XS and is kind of inflexible. It really wants to see a code reference there. But inline Tau5 supports code references by creating a Tau5 object that overrides the, the call operator. And it just tells you, oh, this is no code reference. I cannot call this, even though it could. So this, these are just the methods that we override. And really, I have to say, it's actually good that we are subclassing, because I think this is actually much nicer code. We have real methods, we have method signatures in Tau 6. So we don't really need this uh, code reference mechan mechanism that HTML parser provides. And here we see one of my favorite Tau 6 features. Strings, like content, have an event method that can actually outstand just as much as possible and then indent again. I've done this before in Tau 5 using regular expressions, and it took me like 20 tries to get it right. And here it's just a provided method. So to finish this up, um, running the our pretty printer HTML parser example is pretty much as straightforward as you can imagine. Just pass in the Tau 5 object method and I would really like to stop here again but there's another bug so <laughs> it turns out tall six objects have an end method it's implemented by the list class so you might ask what does what does list have anything to do with this we don't deal with lists here but as more it's explained to me on the IRC channel, Tau 6 intentionally confuses lists of size 1 with scalars, who do have an end method. So if you use <coughs> HTML parser using inline Tau 5, just make sure that you always have your own end method. Otherwise, you will get strange error, method error messages about end being called with the wrong number of arguments. Took me a while to find this out. So equipped with this knowledge, coming back to Catalyst, you would say, oh, it's just a matter of rinse and repeat and use Tau 5 parent again, and we can write Catalyst controllers in Tau 6. And it would probably look like this. But that's not enough, because Catalyst is based on move nowadays. And it uses class mob introspection capability to find the action method and information about how to map the URLs to these actions. So um, the information about how to map URLs is contained in subroutine attributes. But Tor6 does not have subroutine attributes. And class mob 
only can deal with plastic that itself created. So what I did was write a replacement for class mob called class six mob. If you can't read the slide, don't worry, because <coughs> class six already supports introspection. So all I really had to do is write a couple of one-liner methods that map the class mob API to the class six introspection API. With this, I was already able to hook up a class six class as a catalyst controller. And this would be actually enough to use class six in catalyst based projects. But um, not exactly enough because there's one other question missi missing. Uh, um, what about the subroutine attribute? So Prol6 does not have subroutine attributes, but it has a more generic mechanism called traits. Traits allow you to attach meta information to all kinds of objects, including methods. So I wrote a Prol5 attribute role and a trait which we can use to attach just the information that we need to our action method. And the class, the Prol6 mob, class mob replacement uses this information to pass it back to Catalyst. And now Catalyst actually knows how to map URLs to our Prol6 method, which really is enough to use Catalyst in Prol6. It's enough, but there's still one tiny annoying issue left. Catalyst automatically uh, loads modules from the module view and controller namespaces of your application. And of course, it expects this, these modules to be written in Prol5. So you'd have to have um, in parallel a Prol5 class tree and a Prol6 class tree. And the Prol5 classes would probably look a lot like this. Just uh, lots of boilerplate and followed by some loading of Prol6 module and delegating. But there's a solution for that too. Inline Prol5 automatically creates a Prol5 package called v6 inline. And by using v6 inline, you can hand over the rest of the file to Prol6 for processing. And with this, we can have our Prol6 implementations of controllers, models, and views in the files that Catalyst automatically loads for us. And it also provides my most favorite feature. If you look closely at the bottom, there's no static one anymore because v6 inline is actually implemented as a source filter and it replaces all your Prol6 code with a static one. I know source filters are evil and every everything, but they are evil because you cannot stack them. But you do not want to use any other source filters with your Prol6 code, you don't need that. So I guess in this case, it's kind of okay. <laughs> So, I'm a bit daring, so I'll try to do a live demo, just to lighten things up a bit. <coughs> I've written a very small Catalyst application using these mechanisms. This well, application uses a Prol6 grammar to parse an awstats cache file read out the statistics information and uses the Prol6 SDP module to display a nice graph. Oh. So I've shown you a lot of things that do work in inline Prol5. So let's talk a bit about what does not work. Obviously, 
source filters written in Perl 5 would be highly surprised by finding Perl 6 code. <coughs> so those are out of the question. Um, probably everything in the devil namespace is a bit too low level to be of any use in a Perl 6 program. And of course, everything in the Perl 6 namespace is kind of obsolete, <laughs> having the real Perl 6 thing. Excellent question. I did not have this use case yet, so it's not implemented. Um, but, you know, uh, IO is very object oriented in Perl 5 nowadays, so you can just pass objects back and forth that work like IO objects. So I guess it would actually work quite nicely. What's the best place to put this stuff? Um, both Perl 6 and Perl 5 code will run at the native speed. So the cost in performance is whenever you switch between those languages. When you call a Perl 5 method from Perl 6, you have a small overhead. Um, but I guess if you call a lot between those languages, you should rethink your architecture. Because if this overhead is a large part of your performance cost, then the thing you call can only be like be rather small, so it's probably easy to, to port this small bit. Um, back to limitations, yeah. as you've seen, introspection gives you some interesting challenges, but challenges that can be overcome. So another question you may ask is, are there alternatives? <laughs> I'm glad you asked this question because indeed there are. Um, the V5 package for Perl 6 is a re-implementation of Perl 5 written in Perl 6. It uses a Perl 6 grammar to parse Perl 5 code. Uh, it parses this code and turns it into the same abstract syntax tree as native Perl 6 code. So you can um, have all the benefits of native Perl 6 code like optimization and just-in-time compilation and threading support. What it does not do is any kind of access, and it never will. It also does not deal very well with uh, um, devil declare kind of parsing interference. So um, to get all the nice performance characteristics, I'd suggest if you can get away with it, use V5 instead of inline Perl 5. But if you hate a wall, so to say, <coughs> you can always turn to inline Perl 5. Um, there's another alternative. Indeed, I can. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the module you want to use is not written in Perl 5 at all. Maybe, <laughs> it's, maybe it's a Python module. <laughs> and there's uh, certainly one Python module I really would like to use. It's uh, Python's Qt binding. And if you're a KDE user, you probably heard of Qt. It's a C++ library that's, amongst other things, responsible for rendering user interfaces in KDE and some Windows applications and even on Android nowadays. Over the years, there have been quite a few attempts to create Perl bindings for Qt, but they all kind of shared the same fate. They ended up being incomplete and unmaintained. The Python bindings, however, are maintained by the Qt maintainers themselves. So they are up to date and they do work. So I would like to steal those. And 
inline Python to the REST queue. Um, if you stayed with me so far, this is not very surprising code. You have an inline Python module, it has a run method, you can pass it some code. Subclassing, which is very important for writing user interfaces, works just the same as in inline Power 5. There's a Python parent, parent role. You can pass it uh, the base classes. And as you can see here, it supports multiple inheritance, just like uh, the Power 5 parent role does as well. Implementing methods is very straightforward. This is uh, some copy and paste from the PyTube for tutorial, which is a bit of adaption of syntax, but not much. And another method that uh, also shows how to call static um, class methods in Python. <coughs> and then, last but not least, running the application again pretty straightforward copy and paste from the tutorial. If you look closely, you may wonder why this underscore is there. Because in the Qt uh, library itself, this method is just called exec. But it turns out exec is a keyword in Python. So they could not name their method exec. Because unlike the Power 6 developers, the Python developers said, oh, it's more important to make implementing a Python parser easy. Well, the Power 6 developers say, well, let's torture the developers <laughs> for the sake of the users, and they really do. So I can show you another little demo since I have <coughs> some time. Here it is, the very first um, Perl program using Python's Qt bindings. And if we quit, we even get nagged by this are you really sure method. So with this, I want to go back to my goal for today. I think I think I reached my goal. Um, there should be nothing standing in your way to if you want to try Perl 6. So I can only tell you, try it. <coughs> you can find this code on GitHub. You can find the slides online containing all the examples I've shown you and and they are all complete, and you can all run them. So, which questions are left? <coughs> Please. Not yet. I have thought about um, adding these gotchas to the documentation, and I will. But I also am thinking about how to remove the problem altogether. Because most of them are just because of the way inline Power 5 is implemented right now. <coughs> uh, it was a very naive implementation. I did the just the first thing I found that worked. And maybe Jonathan has some ideas on how to improve. He looks like that. <laughs> I will. <laughs> we love evil. <laughs> okay, which other questions are there left? If not right now, you can find me around here in this area probably throughout the day. 
and uh, just approach me or ask me on the IRC channel. And again, thank you very much for listening and a big thank you to all the people involved in writing Call, call 6 and Call 5 for that. And the very nice people that helped me on the IRC channel writing my very first Call 6 software. Thank you.